Good morning, good morning. Um, we are in a, a series going through the book of Nehemiah. And um, if you missed last week, it was uh, the first kind of introductory. We went through chapter one. Um, I would, I don't normally say this, but I would highly advise you to go back and to, to listen, um, whether that's on our uh, podcast or, or YouTube um, because specifically, there was in the beginning, when I when it first began, um, I had Michael Milne come up and share a prophetic word that was really just a confirmation, not just to, um, to me kind of personally in, in, in kind of where we're, where we're heading, but I think it, it's kind of a course setting for our church moving forward um, as like a time of, of Nehemiah, uh, a Nehemiah time that we're moving into. And so I just want to encourage you, um, if you weren't there, just kind of get back in there and, and be able to listen to that prophetic word, as well as just realize that um, this isn't, I think, I, the, in my spirit, I'm like, this is not just another, like we're going through a book of the Bible together. I feel like uh, I just want to encourage you, if you're a part of our church, to sit up, lean in, and allow God to be able to speak to you through these words, through his word, um, personally and also corporately about, about where we're headed as a church. Um, so if you turn with me to, to Nehemiah chapter 2, um, we're going to kind of walk, work down through it like we normally do. I'm not going to have you stand and, and we'll, we won't read through the entire chapter, but we're, we're going to kind of work down through it. So as you're turning to, to Nehemiah in chapter 2, um, let me kind of give you an overall, like, kind of overarching theme. The book of Nehemiah is about a man that was blessed with a burden. And when God blesses you with a burden, it's not overbearing, it's not anxiety producing, it doesn't wear you out. Nehemiah's burden was for God's people. And uh, he, was, he heard word that they were being bullied, that they were being shamed, and uh, his heart broke. He wept over the, the state of God's people in Jerusalem. And he thought, somebody really needs to do something, and it might as well be me. And so if we think of it like a burden, a God-given burden, begins when a person is consumed with the tension between what could be and what is. And this is what was going on in the heart of Nehemiah as he's just realizing like, man, I, he's heartbroken and burdened for the things that burden the heart of God. And then when he rece receives the burden, God gives him a vision. And the vision is a way out, a way through. It's to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that lay in ruin. It would, it would, it would bring protection back to the people that were being ransacked and um, stolen from and invaded as well as, he says, that we'll no longer be a disgrace. We'll no longer be in disgrace. However, Nehemiah has no money. He's got no power. He's got no status. He's got no influence. He has no followers. And beyond that, he's living 800 miles away from these people and this city that is breaking his heart that he hears about. As, and he's, as a cup, he's a cupbearer to the king of Persia, Artaxerxes. And so we ended up last week in chapter two where Nehemiah finally, after four months of receiving this burden, asks the king the, the big question. Nehemiah chapter two, verse five. He says this, if it pleases the king and if your ancestors, or excuse me, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. And he admits in verse two, just a couple of verses before that, that he is very much afraid. That's what it says, very much afraid to even ask the king this question. Because who is he? He's a cupbearer. He's a, he's a wine, a possible poison wine taster, right? He, uh, he tastes the food for the king before the king eats it, just in case it might be poisoned. It doesn't go well for the cupbearer, but long live the king. That's his job, right? Like, He's very much afraid. He has, he has no influence at this point. and doesn't know how the king's going to respond. But God's burden also comes with God's boldness. Like when God places a burden on you, just expect that you're going to start walking in a boldness that you never had before. Because when you know that you know that you know that God has placed a burden on you, you can walk confidently in it, knowing that, knowing that in boldness and in courage, not, not of your own, but in the Lord. Amen. So Nehemiah is probably more than anyone stunned at the king's response in verse six. This is what the king says. Then the king 
with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? Which is a crazy, crazy answer for the king to, you know, answer this cupbearer. Essentially, he's saying like, yeah, you can go. Like, how much time will you need off for FMLA? Like, what, what is this? This is the beginning of FMLA. Like, he's, he's literally like, what do you need? What do you need, six months? What do you, how, how much time do you need off, right? Um, I want you to think about how difficult it must have been for Nehemiah to answer this question. He's like, hey, um, Nehemiah, uh, you've been given a burden to go rebuild the ruins of your people. Like, you're going to go, and who knows how long this is going to take, but this is a big deal. This is a big burden. You're, it's going to require a lot of energy, a lot of people working together in unity. You're going to have to, I mean, you're going to learn so much about leadership and all of these things. So the king's like, yeah, you can go, but like, when are you going to come back and, and be, um, you know, my taster to my possibly poisoned wine? Like, when, when are you going to, like, that's a humbling question. You're going to go, and I'm going to send you, and you're going to go, and you're going to help rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, but when are you going to come back and possibly die when you taste my, my steak? When, when how, how long is that? You're really good at what you do. I mean, the last one only lasted a week, right? Like, <laughs> but you've been real good. Like, when, I know you got big dreams and big vision and big burden and all of these things, and I support you, but when are you going to come back to do the thing that, when are you going to be my servant again? That's humbling. In verse 6, it says, It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. Can I encourage you in this? In your notes, it says this, The bigger the burden, the more humility is required. The bigger the burden, the more that humility is required. Um, Nehemiah actually sets a time. He's like, I'm going to go, I'm going to, you're sending me, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I'm going to go rebuild these walls, but then I'm going to come back and be your wine taster. I'm going to be your servant, your cupbearer again. And he actually sets a time for when he plans to come back to be the cupbearer again. In his mind, it would have been easy to think like, well, you just don't understand. Like, I mean, God has given me like a big calling on my life. It's probably, it's like, it's bigger than this. I'm just telling you, it's huge. I've got a big calling. I can't be cup barren no more. Like, I, ain't nobody got time for that. Like, I, I've got a big call on my life. But talk about humility. Talk about humility. Like, as Nehemiah literally sets a time. Here's what I would say. Do you have a big calling on your life? Do the dishes, big man. You're like, oh man, you have no idea the burden that God is like I, for, the, for the vision, for the, for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Go mow your lawn. Go mow your lawn. Please, mow your lawn for the sake of it. No, mo, no mow November, no mow, whatever, whatever that, all that. Please. You want to do great things for God? Take out the trash. Serve other people. The bigger the burden that God places on you, the greater the need for humility I think that more so than what the king was asking him, it was a test of humility before the Lord. I'm going to put this big burden on you. Are you willing to go back and do the thing that you were doing before? The bigger the burden that God places on us, the more that humility is required of us. Number two, God um, is pleased when we plan. Verse seven, I also said to him, catch this, if it pleases the king, he asks for things. He says, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah? Oh, 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 and may I also have a letter to Asaph, king, keeper of the royal parks, so that he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence that I will occupy. And because of the gracious hand of God was on me, the king granted my request. And so he, I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and gave, the kings, gave them the king's letters. And the king had also sent an army officers and cavalry with me. I want you to see this. Nehemiah had a plan. It doesn't say anything in here that God told him to ask for these things. It doesn't say like, I had a vision, an open dream, and God said, thus saith me, you should ask for, you know, letters for the trans-Euphrates governors and the Asaph, the keeper of the royal park for free wood. You, you, need to, you need to ask, thus saith me, to do this. Like, I want you to see this. Like, he has a plan. Nehemiah had spent four months praying and planning. So when the right time came, he had a plan. 
Like he was surprised when all of a sudden, oh my gosh, I can't even believe that the, like Artaxerxes actually said, yes, you can go. And he's like, okay, cool. Well, I was waiting for that yes. So now that you say yes, um, I, I'd like letters so that I don't get mugged and safe passage. And then I'd also like free wood. Plan your work and work your plan. Plan your work and work your plan. Here's the reality, and this, this is for just, I think, the, the, the body of Christ, that God is not pleased when we expect him to spare us the pain of failure when we have not even considered the cost of success. Many times we're like, well, God, you just, you, I'm just kind of going. I'm going by the Spirit. I'm just doing this thing. God's like, I actually want you to count the cost. It says that many times throughout the Bible, like count the cost before you begin to start the building. And so the King Artaxerxes grants his request, goes above and beyond. He's like, yeah, 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 you can have the free wood, cool. And uh, the, the, here's letters for safe passage. Oh, by the way, I'm also going to send some army officers with you and a cavalry. Oh, that sounds cool. Cool, 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 cool. Where, oh, yeah, yeah I, I could use cavalries. Yeah, horses. I like horses. That's cool. So he, 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 he gets sent out. Now, as soon as he gets sent out, in walks two characters that you will see over and over and over and over again. If you've read ahead, spoiler alert, these are characters you should probably know their names, and they've got weird names. Sanballat and Tobiah. So verse 10. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were, catch these words, very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. So Nehemiah barely, barely begins his assignment. I mean, like, he's, he's like, ah, yeah, yeah, I don't know, whatever you do with horses. And like, ah, yeah, and then they start going. They literally start moving. And all of a sudden, Sanballat and Tobiah, they hear about this, and they are greatly disturbed. He's barely started, and he faces his first opposition. And this is the reality, this. When you begin to move forward in God's calling, don't be surprised when you have opponents that you never had before. They didn't even know who this Jew named Nehemiah was. He's compared to the king. Who cares? I mean, nobody cares about that. Like, yeah, whatever you're... I, no, Nehemiah never knew about Sanballat and Tobiah, who, who these guys were. But all of a sudden, now that Nehemiah has now stepped into his calling, he's now a target. And it says, I think these words are interesting, it says that they were greatly, very much disturbed. What are they disturbed about? What, what, what are they so upset about? It says, because someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. In other words, they're upset that somebody was doing something. Yeah, somebody should do something. Somebody ought to do something. And as soon as somebody does something, all of a sudden... You have enemies that you never thought that you would have. Nehemiah was coming to help bring freedom, to help bring hope to people, and it greatly disturbed these two yahoos. Did you know that you can be doing the right thing, catch this, and have haters rise up to convince you that it's the wrong thing? Uh, this happens to us today. Our world is completely upside down. Our world says that right is wrong and, and wrong is right. And so you're trying to live right before God and the world will try to tell you that what you're doing is wrong. And so maybe, this will maybe relate to you personally. So maybe like you just came to faith recently, faith in Christ. Maybe um, God has um, delivered you from something, an area of your life. You found freedom in an area of your life. You, you may have friends that seemed to be happier when you were lost, addicted, broken, overwhelmed. In fact, you may have people in your life who are concerned or even very much disturbed at the good things that are happening in your life. Hey, you know, we've just been talking, you know, we're just like, I don't know, you're just going to church and stuff and just, I don't know, you just... You used to party, you, used to do, you, you just not, you're kind of boring. I don't know, we're just, we're, con we're very much concerned. We're greatly concerned about you. 
When you walk by faith, you will usually collide with Sanballat's and Tobias. This is in the natural. In the spiritual, the devil hates it when you move in on his territory. I mean, he, like, Nehemiah was doing everything. He was just keeping his nose. He was doing everything. He's just living his life, doing his things. All of a sudden now he starts living on mission. He starts moving towards Jerusalem and all of a sudden everything just starts breaking loose, right? The devil really hates it when you start taking back territory that he put a claim on. He doesn't own it and he actually doesn't have a stake in that territory, but all of a sudden now, you want to greatly disturb the enemy? Well, just start taking back territory because he's happiest when you're ashamed and bullied and addicted and broken and isolated and overwhelmed. That's where he wants to keep you. And if he gets very much disturbed when you begin disturbing the status quo. And this is what happens with Nehemiah. Like opposition, here, some of you, maybe someone here needs to hear this. Opposition doesn't necessarily mean that you're outside of God's will. Sometimes that actually is an indicator that you're in the very center of it. And this is what's going on in Nehemiah's life. Like, it reinforces like, oh, oh, okay, wow, I'm a target all of a sudden now. All I'm doing is trying to bring hope and freedom to God's people, and why is this wrong? It's very much disturbing. Verse 11, it says, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, so Nehemiah gets to Jerusalem, and he literally tells no one about his burden, about his vision, about his plan, nothing. And for three days, he does nothing. Nothing, at least, that he writes down. And then he begins to do something in verse 12. I set out during the night with a few others. I, I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. And there were no mounts, there were no horses right, with me, except the one that I was riding on. So he goes out alone at night to inspect the walls. But I want you to see this. Like, he's not just inspecting walls. He's becoming acquainted with the ruins that he's called to rebuild. So he goes around, and you can read on your own. Like, he goes around, he starts, he, he touches the ruins. He, he walks on the rubble. He, he actually touches where the gates were, but they're long gone because they've been burned with fire. Like, he becomes acquainted with the ruins that are all around him. In your notes, it says this, that successful rebuilders, whether you are rebuilding ruins or relationships, are willing to confront themselves with the brutal facts. He sees all of it alone. It's not a publicity stunt. He's walking the walls. He's seeing the rubble. He's seeing the weeds that have long grown up in the disrepair all around the city. He walks in it. He has to get off his horse because things have collapsed so much that he has to walk this thing out by himself. A good leader has to get the right information to make good decisions. Even good leaders make bad decisions with wrong information. And so he knows, I got to walk this thing myself. I've heard news. I've, people have told me about it. In fact, I can stand back from afar and see what's going on, but I want to I walk it. I want to feel it. I want to touch it. I want to see it. I want to be confronted with the brutal facts of the ruins that are all around us. If you want to begin to rebuild something, then you must be willing to confront yourselves with the brutal facts of it. I, I love it because Nehemiah begins this work of rebuilding at night by himself, and he talks to no one. He just takes a few of his guys with him, and there are very few that, that, that come along with him as he walks around and inspects and becomes acquainted with the ruins. And he does it by himself. We live in a world of social media where, where we've convinced ourselves that posting about something means that I'm doing something. Well, I posted about it. I, I reposted it. I retweeted it. I, I, I'm doing something. I'm, I'm healing the world one post at a time. You're all welcome, right? Here's the reality, though. Character is who you are when nobody's watching. It's what you do when you're not posting it all over the place. And it's not about publicity. And it's not a filtered, great, oh, look at everything I'm doing. It's so great. Isn't it awesome? Amazing, right? 
Character is who you are when nobody's watching, though. Like, character is, is being willing to walk the ruins and assess the damage yourself because nobody can do that for you. And this guy is, I mean, I absolutely love how he begins before he even begins. And, and even, I think, this is a Christian thing that, <laughs> that modern-day Christians use a lot about open doors, right? Like, open doors and closed doors. Like, I don't know, I'm just waiting for an open door. Like, like a, if it's a closed door, keep it closed. But if God opens up a door, then I'll walk through it. But I'm not looking for a door. But if there's a door door, but it's a locked door, but it's a double, sometimes a swinging door. Like all these doors, we're very much into doors. Closed doors, shut doors, open doors. Uh, wedged open doors. Do I kick the door open? Do I walk through it? Is it a close? Is it a half close? What's, what, when do I do what? All these things. We're very, very concerned about doors. As if doors show up out of nowhere, like portals just appear. We're like, oh, I've been waiting for this door, right? I've been praying about a door. And there's the door. I can walk through this thing now. As if opportunities randomly show up. But what I've found is that opportunity doesn't usually come knocking on my door out of nowhere, more often than not, doors open when you knock on them. Opportunities come when you are looking for them. And so he literally becomes acquainted with the ruins, realizing like, we've got to do something. I have to do something. Somebody should do something. It might as well be me. And then Nehemiah says it, and he speaks it out loud. He's walked the walls. He's seen the ruins. He's been acquainted with the problem. And in verse 17, he speaks it. He says, then I said to them, he's speaking to the people now. He says, you see the trouble that we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. That's, that's his like thing. It's like, what, two, three sentences, right? He just, this is, this is the deal. What is he saying? The first thing he does is he poses the problem. Notice that he uses words like we and us a lot because words have power. And rebuilders say we an awful lot um, because rebuilders know that like rebuilding is a team sport, that they can't do it on their own. And so he just identifies himself with the need. He goes right in. I mean, he's 800 miles away. He was a cupbearer to the king. He was drinking wine, hoping he wasn't going to die just like a week ago. And now he's walking in and he's saying, look it, we need to do something. We are in, we are in ruin. We are in disgrace. We come, let us do something about this. Words have power. And it would do no good for Nehemiah just to start casting blame and criticism. Like, hey guys, Looks like you got yourselves into quite a predicament, huh? It's a mess around here. I was in Persia, came in here. What the heck's going on? Somebody needs to do something around here. Maybe one of y'all should start rebuilding this wall and do something, you lazy bums, right? It, wouldn't, it would do no good, right? You guys are like, I don't know. I'm feeling very inspired, right? Like, I, <laughs> where's the wall? Where's the wall, right? <laughs> Like, he just, it would do no good for him to just start, like, yelling at people and accusing them and casting blame and criticism. Instead, he identifies himself with the need. He says, we need to do something. Folks, this relates to all aspects of rebuilding something in our lives. Because unless we are willing to own our part of the problem, we will never own our part of the solution. He just says, no, we need to do something. For example, like, if you really want to work on rebuilding your marriage, start using the words we instead of me a whole lot more. Because not only does he identify himself with the need and say, hey, we should do something, he confronts himself and everyone else with the brutal facts of their reality. Because God won't fix what you won't face. He just speaks it right out. He essentially says, hey, everyone, hey, come on. Look at the ruins that we are walking over and walking around. We don't even have front doors on our homes. We are in trouble. This place is in ruins. We need to do something about this. One in your notes, it says this. When you live in ruin, the trouble is that rubble begins to look normal doesn't it? When you start looking around, you're just like, I don't know, what is this? This 
oh, that used to be a wall? Well, I don't know. I thought it was just kind of a rock garden. <laughs> right? Like, we just kind of walk around doing our thing because rubble begins to look normal around people that live in ruins. And this had become normal to them, like 141 years of normal to them. I mean, well, it is what it is at that point, right? I mean, like, nothing's going to change. It was there for my kids and my grandkids. And uh, why? I mean, this is the way it's always been. Things aren't going ch- to change. Familiarity is the enemy of change. Oh, it is what it is. What do you mean? What do you mean, rebuild? This is just the way things are. <laughs> Settle down there, you little whippersnapper. You know, we tried that before. You know, my great uncle, Roger, he built that side, but that fell over because he's not a very good mason. But like, I mean, like, familiarity is the enemy to change. Like Newton's first law of motion is, is true when it comes to familiarity. Newton's first law of motion is this. Objects at rest tend to stay at rest unless they are acted upon by an unequal force. And when we become familiar, when something becomes normal, it is not only maintained, it is many times defended. Well, that's just how it is. That's just, what are you coming in here and changing things? Things don't need to change. They've been fine. They were good for my parents and good for their parents. And what are you coming in here saying that things need to be different? They become not only maintained, they're defended. And many times we won't actually see what needs to happen until we see it differently. Because objects at rest tend to stay at rest unless they are acted upon by an unequal force. When something is considered normal, it is maintained and defended, and it will require someone else to many times empower you to see a different perspective of it. Which is why it's good to not only have trusted friends that like, will tell you the truth even when you don't want to hear it, but wisdom from good counseling. Nehemiah had to travel 800 miles to give them a new perspective. 800 miles, a new guy coming in with a burden from God had to come all the way in there to tell them what they should have already seen. But many times when you have the same old perspective and it's just normal, you're looking at things that you're not seeing. You're seeing the rubble, but you don't see what it could be. You're seeing what it is. And when all you see is what it is, well... It is what it is. And he comes in to help them see things that they were just looking at. That's the beauty of this guy. I love him. Verse 17, he says, Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And then he tells them why. you got to catch this. He says, and, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I want, you got to catch this. Because Nehemiah doesn't come in and say, hey guys, I'm going to try to motivate you externally. The first 100 volunteers get a free candy bar. Come on, who's going to sign up right here? We got a little sign up list right here. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, you want a candy bar? Ah, I see you. You look like you need a candy bar. Like he doesn't come in there and try to like motivate them externally. He doesn't say, hey guys, you know what? We're going to build the greatest wall. So all the other competitors' walls look like fences compared to our wall. Nobody cares about that. He literally comes in and he starts to motivate them internally by casting hope of what could be in the midst of what is. He's like, guys, the task is to rebuild a wall. But we're not just rebuilding a wall. We're rebuilding our lost identity. And that, that is something that we could all relate to. To. He's like, are you wanting to build this? It's going to look like a wall, but it is our lost identity. And then he tells them about the momentum that had already begun. Why? Because everybody loves to be on a winning team. He says, verse 18, I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. The people are both inspired and empowered by this. They're inspired by the testimony of what the king said. Are you kidding me? You asked the king that and he didn't kill you? Like he literally, oh, he sent you and he gave you and free wood? We get free wood? This is, what? And they're also empowered because they realize they are convinced that God is in it. 
I mean, the hand of God is definitely on this. Okay, okay, okay. And they say, they replied in verse 18, let us start rebuilding. And so they began this good work. Do you realize that they have been looking at these ruins for 141 years? Nothing has changed. The ruins are still there. So why are they getting excited? What changed? What is it that shifted? Why have they gone from, well, I don't know, it is what it is, to, yeah, let's do this thing. Let's start rebuilding. Let's do this good work. I think it's because Nehemiah gave them hope to crawl out of their apathy. Listen, hope is an incredibly powerful thing. Because if you break a person's spirit, they will never dream outside of their own discouragement. No, it is what it is. All of a sudden, Nehemiah comes in and provides hope for them to be able to see outside of it is what it is to what could it be. And just as soon as they begin to get excited of what could be, they immediately begin to get mocked and ridiculed. Hallelujah. Verse 19, but when Sanballat, told you, you better remember that dude's name, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and they brought along a new friend, Geshem, the Arab. Right? It sounds like the beginning of a joke. Anyway, um, <laughs> Geshem, the Arab, heard about it, and they ridiculed, they mocked and ridiculed us. Because when you are disgraced and humiliated, folks, words work just as good as actions, don't they? Words can many times paralyze you even more than actions. And he says, it says this, this is what they said to him. What is this you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? In your notes, it says this, when you engage your mission, you will enrage the enemy. And many times it will come in the form of verbal assault. We all know this, like the, the kids rhyme growing up, right? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never, hurt. that's a bunch of bull. We know that's a bunch of bull, right? Like, I mean, there are many times where I'm like, I wish I just, I wish you just punched me in the face rather than said the thing you said. Because like, I, the scar heals, but the words sink in, don't they? It's a bunch of bull. Um, Proverbs 18, verse 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. Have you ever noticed that negative words seem to appear larger and carry much more clout than positive ones. You can hear like 10 positive words. You get, somebody comes in like, hey, this is great, this is great, you're doing a great job, great, 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 great. But that one negative one, it's like all it wants to do is just overpower the other 10. And it's the one thing you think about. It's the one thing that sticks with you. And many of us, we, it's like a highlight reel of negativity. Just going, 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 going. We just hear those. We hear the negatives far louder than the positives. And I want you to realize this, like Nehemiah has received a God-given burden. It's not his. He's not even related. I mean, 800 miles away, God put this on him. He has experienced the favor of God. He has experienced the favor of the king. He has prayed up and the Israelites have now literally confirmed his calling and are ready to follow him. And all of a sudden, three men, a vocal minority, not even involved in the rebuilding. I mean, they're not even there, like, helping move things and, like, move rubble. They're just standing on the outside critiquing everything that's happening. Three men that have a loud voice that would paralyze or derail the mission. And they're tempting to listen to because of the fear they instill. But what do you think you're doing? I mean, essentially, that's what they're saying. Like, who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing here? For me, as like a church leader, you, you, might, you might imagine how often I would hear things like, uh, you know, well, people have said, I've heard, I've he I'm not going to say I've just heard. I've gotten to the point where I'm like, who? Name them. <laughs> who is it? Who said it? Is it one person, two person, 200 people? I got to know. I got to know what we're talking about here. Well, I can't. They, they wouldn't. I just, I just know. I know. Mike, you've been talking to you, yourself? Who? 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 
I, I just can't. I can't tell you. Listen, here's what I'm, my point is this. I am never saying to dismiss negative feedback because many times the best feedback you get is negative feedback. You just don't want it. You just don't like it. But there is a difference between negative feedback and gaslighting. Okay, thanks. <laughs> and as a leader, as a leader in your home, as a business leader, as a leader in the church, as a leader, as a leader, if you are making decisions in fear or in reaction to a nameless, faceless, numberless, nebulous group of hypothetical people, you are bound to make a bad decision. Come on. So I would just say this, get to the root. Get, wh wh who said it? San Ballot, Tobiah, and who's Geshem? Who's this guy? I don't even know Geshem, right? Geshem the Arab? That's literally what you're known as? Like, that's so weird. Like, but like, get to the root of it. It doesn't mean dismiss it. It just means like, get to the root of where it's coming from because many times just hearing a negative word can feel like it's much bigger than it actually is. And we amplify it. We give it much more airtime in our own heads than it really deserves. Number seven is this. The last one is a settled spirit will give you confidence to continue. Ah, this, is the, this is the key, folks. A settled spirit will give you confidence to continue. There are some things that you just need to get settled. You just got to get them settled inside of you before you even start to rebuild. If you're rebuilding a relationship, you're rebuilding a marriage, you're rebu whatever you're rebuilding, whatever, whatever wall God has called you to, you just got to get some things settled before you even start. Because... As you look at the wall that God is calling you to, you need to realize that there will be opponents that you never had before and you least expected. There will be, there will be brutal facts that you would rather avoid because we never like to be confronted with those. And there will be distractions that would love to unsettle your insecurities. All with the end goal of taking you off the wall before you even get started before you even get started. Settle it with the Lord. Ask him for a settled spirit. Before we move on, I just, if, if, if this is reckon, like reckoning with you right now, I just, wanna, I just wanna pray for you right now. If this is where you're at, I just wanna just encourage you to put, place your hand over your chest as we pray. Lord, I just pray for a settled spirit in this place. The walls that you've called us to, to rebuild that area of our life that you're calling each and every individual to today, I pray that for a settled spirit, that, that opponents, that distractions, that all of those things would never, even, even the whole idea of it is what it is and it's never going to change and it's always going to be this way, will just fall to the wayside so that we could see what could be in the midst of what is. Lord, I pray for a settled spirit in this place. Lord, I pray for hope. I pray hope would just be instilled into God's people. Lord, that they would be able to see, not just look at the ruins, that they would be able to see with your eyes what it could be, not just look at what it is. And so, Lord, in, I, I just pray for courage and boldness in here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Why don't you stand with me? Um, I think you can tell I'm excited about this. Um, I love Nehemiah's answer. It ends chapter two. He says, I answered them. This is, this is Sanballat and Tobiah and their new friend Geshem. Um, I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Hallelujah. The question that they posed to him was essentially, what do you think you're doing? No, really, what do you think you are doing? It has this feeling of like, who do you think you are? what do you think you're doing? And Nehemiah doesn't answer. He deflects it. And he essentially tells them, take it up with God. 
Take it up with God. You need, you need to see his confidence here. His confidence is not in himself. His confidence, he says, is in the God of heaven. Because confidence in yourself is also called pride. Confidence in God is called faith. When you're leading, make sure you're leading people in faith, not pride. Amen? Amen. Then you can stand tall in the face of adversaries and say, take it up with God. Sorry. It's not my burden. He gave it to me. I'm just trying to execute it. I'm just trying to be obedient to that which God has placed in my hands. So if you don't like it, you might want to get with God on it. Just telling you. Because I already did. I would highly advise you to as well. Psalm 127 says this, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. When we attempt to build something in our own power, we build in vain. When the Lord is the one who is building, then no one but God will be able to stop the work. This is the confidence that Nehemiah stood in. Because a settled spirit gives you confidence to continue. So Nehemiah can, can boldly speak to these naysayers, these guys who... I don't know how much clout they have or not. I mean, like at this point, he's just like, yikes, was not expecting these dudes. He can confidently say, listen, guys, I'm not really going to be arguing with you about whether or not what I'm doing is right or good. Like I'm already settled with my heavenly father about this. And I would suggest you do the same. And so if maybe for, for you today, there are some things that you just need to get settled today. I would encourage you to settle them. To ask God for a settled spirit. To say, God, I, th- over anything, Lord, I pray you would just make this settled in me. And it's not just an emotional decision I'm going to make and then walk out the door and leave it here. But Lord, I pray you would settle something on the inside of me. The wall that you've placed me on, I'm doing a good work and I can't come down from it. And I won't allow distractions or naysayers or opponents or even my own feelings to draw me away from it. Because this isn't an emotional decision that I'm making today. This isn't something that's going to last a day or a week. Like, I'm making a decision to do it. Because somebody should do something, and it might as well be me. And so I, I say it out loud today, and I won't be distracted from it. Lord, I thank you for the calling that you've placed on each and every single one of us in the spheres of influence that you've placed each of us in. For some of us in our families, in our marriages, for some of us in the church, for some of us it's, it's in the workplace as we're nurses, as we're, as we're uh, accountants, as we're caregivers, as we're, as whatever this looks like. Lord, I pray that we would just settle some things in our own spirit. Have your way in us, Lord, as we seek to honor you, knowing that it's you that placed us here. May we stay on the wall that you've placed before us and not come down for anything. In Jesus' name, let's worship together.